What's up, everyone, and welcome to Now, Next, Never. Welcome back, really. Anyway, it's Thursday. I'm Nicole Casperson, and with me, as always, are my co-hosts, Alana Saparu and Zaid Admani. Um, Zaid, what's going on today? Yes, great stories today. Oil companies are mining Bitcoin. Could this be a win-win for crypto and the environment? We're going to find out. BlackRock president Rob Capito says we're entitled, and I think we have to listen to what he has to say. Ugh. Right, Delano? No. Yes, Zaid, yes. Why yes, Delano? <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we have digital asset expert Larry Souza in the house. She's on to explain how to show people the light on blockchain technology. So guess what? Stick with us. Make sure you like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, or we're going to get into it right now. All right, first story of the day. Oil and gas companies are mining Bitcoin, but is this the benef is this beneficial for the environment? And how could this impact the revenue of oil and gas companies? So before we dive into that, let me kind of explain what's going on, right? So I had the pleasure of working in oil and gas right when I graduated college in 2014. I'm a civil structural engineer, worked at an oil and gas company back in the day. And uh, I had a little bit of exposure to how some of this stuff works. So what these companies typically do when it comes to finding oil and gas, there's remote wells out in the middle of Texas, remote villages in Texas and North Dakota, where they, where they build wells and dig for oil and gas. Now, typically, when they dig, if they hit oil, it's great. You can, you can, you can get a truck to your remote site and, uh, and, and, and transport the oil back to a refinery. But if you hit gas, which happens all the time, you can't transport gas from a remote site to anywhere else. You can't, you can't uh, put that on a truck. You only, you, you, you only have two options. Number one, build a pipeline to the site. And if, there's not, if it's a small site or there's not, there's not that much gas, you're not gonna spend the money to build a pipeline. Or number two, you literally just let the gas go into the atmosphere, which is bad for the environment. Or you could also flare, it means literally burn the gas, which is also bad for the environment. Now what a lot of startups have been doing now is been partnering up with these remote wells and these oil and gas companies, sending out a generator to these remote sites and using the natural gas that they find at these remote sites to power the generator. And the generator then generates electricity to, for these Bitcoin miners that are also on site. Hmm. That's, that's, what, that, that, that's, that's exact, kind of exactly what's going on. So instead of wasting the natural gas that these companies find, they end up using it for the generator, which then generates electricity, which is then used to mine Bitcoin. Mm. I did a little back of the napkin math here, uh, and don't <laughs> I, you know? You got, anyone can check my work. I'm, I'm still kind of figuring it out, but I think approximately 50% of the energy needed to mine Bitcoin can come from this, this from this natural gas that is typically flared every single year in the United States. So that's 50% of the energy that's just being wasted right now can wow. be used to mine Bitcoin. That's crazy. Again. Back of the napkin in math, I'm sure there's some mistakes I've made, but the fact that it's kind of close is pretty impressive. So I want to I want to ask you guys what you guys think. Like Nicole, what do you think of like oil and gas companies doing this and partnering with uh, these companies to to mine Bitcoin from this wasted energy as of right now? Yeah, Zaid. I mean, I hope your your scientific math there is <laughs> is on point because it would be cool, right? It seems like a nice fix. Um, but the big question is, does it really? alleviate the problem. Will we see something, you know, really come of this? For some context, in 2021, Ethereum and Bitcoin mining operations combined emitted more than 78 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Mm. That's an amount equivalent to the annual tailpipe emissions of more than 15.5 million cars. Mm. And that's according to ForexSuggest.com. So the reason this happens is from what is called proof of work, which is actually how users validate crypto transactions by solving complicated math problems. And the energy used to mine these crypto transactions is actually from running programs on their computers to crack the problem. So that's where this energy is coming from. But you know, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. There have been efforts to reduce carbon emissions. The Crypto Climate Accords organization have garnered 250 signatures from individuals and different companies committing themselves to reducing their carbon emissions to net zero by 2030 and eventually completely decarbonizing the entire cryptocurrency industry by 2040. High ambitions, we hope to see it. Um, you know, these are huge reasons why um, there is some skepticism around cryptocurrencies as, as, it's, as it relates to climate risk. So, yeah, I, I think that anything we can do to, to move this forward is, 
is great, but we just have to, you know, kind of wait and wait and see if it actually comes to fruition. Man, Zayden Cole, that was so much math. You guys took me back. Yeah, so, so much math and stats, but I loved it because it helped <laughs> contextualize what's going on. Zayden, thank you for that explanation because someone that doesn't have that background, that helped me understand a little bit more. And what I want to know is like, why would oil companies do this, right? Like, is there something that they could benefit from, from the bottom line or potentially from the profit? Not sure. We don't know for sure, but we do know that it's a really small size of the industry with Bitcoin mining right now. Like Bitcoin miners in 2021 made 15 billion, according to Block Research, which is super small. If you look at ExxonMobil alone, they made 250, over 250 billion in 2021, according to their own financial statement. So like, what is the benefit for, for the oil companies doing this? Is it like Nicole was mentioning, potentially you know, have a PR play or are, are you actually going to like potentially profit from this because right now it looks super small it's still in infancy stages as they mentioned this whole market could potentially be you know galvanized by the oil companies but like what what's the benefit for them like profit wise they like i just don't know i just don't see it i mean yeah it's not really a profit play it's more of a reduced carbon foot footprint play mm -hmm. uh you know and it, it's good pr um but you know i, I don't I, I just like you're saying it's not a oh we're gonna make a lot more money from all this it's just a way for them to get better, get 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 good PR, and you know help uh, their environmental footprint. That that makes a lot of sense. Well, someone who just did not have good PR, Zay Nicole, we had a, a get off my lawn moment. All right, BlackRock President Rob Capito had some comments in the news recently. He stated that for the first time, this generation is going to go into a store and not be able to get what they want. And he also said that we have a very entitled dead generation that has never had to sacrifice. Capito framed his comments in terms of the impact of inflation, including uh, product shortages that we have going on as well. It's for, for those who don't remember, consumer prices have soared 7.9% in the past 12 months through February. And this also comes off of his comments also come off the heels of a, a fidelity report that stated that younger people are just not really feeling saving right now. They want to wait till things get better before they start saving for retirement. Um, I think these comments are a little bit off base. One, I do agree with him on the inflation portion, right? We haven't seen inflation like this in four decades. 1980 was the last time we've seen inflation this high, right? And so that's obviously, that makes sense. But we do on the other side of things, I don't think young people are not, you know, saving or they're, they're not sacrificing. I think they're doing things a little bit differently. One, you have to remember, we have wage increases that we haven't seen in a long time either, Zayn Nicole. I think that's a, a big point, right? And so that has to play a part in how the, the mind frame of us young people are thinking. But Zayn Nicole, I pose this question to you. We'll go with you, Zayn, first. Does he have something here? Is he right? Um, is he right? And what other steps can young people do that are pessimistic about saving can they do for their future, Zayn? I mean, I don't like his word choice, right? The word choice entitled just kind of triggers a lot of people. Definitely triggered me a little bit. So that's not cool, Rob. But I think, I mean, I think low-key, like his message is probably right. Like we are dealing with shortages that we've never had to deal with before in our lifetimes. Like I don't remember having to deal with this. I mean, inflation is at, um, you know, the highest since like the 80s, which I don't remember because I wasn't alive back then. Um, so yeah, I think he's somewhat right. And I think the fact that like this dude who runs, you know, is the president of BlackRock, which has $10 trillion dollars, um, under assets under management, like I feel like we have to kind of take his words a little bit seriously. He just needs better messaging. Um, I think I'm not as pessimistic as as others might be. I think young people need to continue to you know to to learn about investing, to learn the 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 importance of investing. And I think that they have a lot more tools um, at their disposal than previous generations did, right? Uh, but I can empathize with young people saying that, oh my God, like. You know the the economy is not for me, and I'm not going to say for retirement mm -hmm. because you know we have you know there there, there are issues in the on the economy, um, especially with um, income inequality. But there are a lot more opportunities today than there were previously, and I and I'm more optimistic than I am pessimistic. Hmm. I like to think of his. I have so many feelings about his comments, but I'll focus on on the money side. So you know, millennials aren't entitled. They're anxious like so so anxious they 60 percent are constantly stressed about finances according mm -hmm. to key bank and they also just have a different set of priorities and more tools in their hands thanks to a lot of fintech innovations we can build wealth in other ways outside what our parents told us which is just save and don't spend any money you mm -hmm. know that advice is, is so old school mm -hmm. um let's also put into context that he said this amid the largest intergenerational wealth transfer in history which is mm -hmm. happening right now passing about $30 trillion in inheritance or wealth 
from baby boomers to millennials. Mm -hmm. So, and, and guess what? 70% of those millennials say that they would fire their parents' financial advisors, and that's according to Cerulli. So I'm just saying, there might be, he might, BlackRock might be feeling a little bit of the pressure there um, to, to capture this audience, and uh, his wording choice, not doing the, the best uh, for that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's tough because I think that there's a lot of also pressure on kind of uh, newer companies out there to, to help uh, put those tools like we talked about into the hands of millennials so that they can manage their wealth and, and do all of the things without having to, you know, work in an old school way like a, with a financial advisor. But there are also 10% of financial advisors are under the age of 35. So there's not a lot out there that are able to like cater to us uh, specifically or understand our needs. So. We'll see how it goes, but uh, he, he, yeah, that word choice, uh, for lack of a better word, sucked. Um, and it doesn't sound great coming uh, out of his mouth. But yes, mostly aspirational in that there is still so much out there that we can do to, um, you know, make guys like him not say stuff like this, I guess. It, exactly, Nicole. I, I wonder if it's like the pessimism uh, comes from a standpoint of like people just doing things differently. Like, I think that yeah. if any young person, takes out an investment calculator and looks at how they can compound their wealth, you know, by investing and saving over two, one, two, three decades. Like they're doing that, but they also know that there's so many different areas to make money than before that a lot of people are taking different chances, right? They're doing things that are more speculative. They're trying things out a different way. They're into crypto. They're not just doing what our parents did or what Rob did, which is just putting money in an IRA and waiting until three or four, you know, years, decades down the line for them to retire, right? Everyone's doing something super differently right now. And I just think that's where the disconnect comes from. But I don't think young people are out of touch at all. Yeah, Rob. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of what is hot right now, NFTs. Why are NFT sales so hot right now? NFT sales hit over $300 million last week, led by Board Ape Yacht Club, no surprise there, uh, with $90 million in sales. So. This is interesting to me because NFT prices have been in flux after NFT sales had a breakthrough year in 2021. Volume hit $24 billion. But after nearing almost $1 billion in a single week in January, NFT sales then slowed amid an ongoing bear market here in cryptocurrencies. Mm. Yet the Bored Ape Yacht Club and CryptoPunks have maintained their dominance in this space, driving NFT sales as a whole to that over $300 million over the past week. So luckily for us, we have an expert here in digital assets who specializes in bridging the financial generation gap by educating the public on blockchain technology and finance. She has a real passion for the future of money and she is here today to discuss Web3 and how we can explain it to your friends, family, and those who struggle to understand it, like my dad, who I've had to explain <laughs> NFTs to at least three or four times. Please welcome Lori Sousa. Well, hi, hi there. Lori. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, to kick it off, you know, just kind of on the heels of what we were talking about with like the NFT price influx and Board Ape Yacht Club and all of the things, you know, can you help us just understand the sales discrepancies that we're seeing and kind of the, the bounce back and forth and why this is happening with NFTs? Yeah, it's pretty fascinating, isn't it? And it has a lot to do with what you just talked about with the new economy, our new digital economy. And so it's basically part of the revolution that's happening right now in uh, tokenomics. And so tokenomics allows us to create our, our own ecosystems and pretty much not, it, it's a little defiant to the current central systems that we have, or centralized systems. So when you look at somebody being able to raise so much money for a bored ape, <laughs> it, it just tells you that the, the power in the tokenomics and what somebody who holds their own data can make, rather than everybody is used to uploading their own data into a centralized system like a cloud or Facebook, uh, when you give your data away in the intranet, well, you're actually giving your data to the large conglomerate corporations of Google and Facebook and Yahoo so that they can sell your data and use it. Yep. Now people are keeping their data and they're charging a lot of money for it. Mm -hmm. And so they get to own their data for the lifetime of blockchain. Because when you put your data on blockchain, well, it's part of the Web3, mm -hmm. and that's part of the decentralized internet that we're building right now, which is really cool because it, get, it puts power back to the people. 
that, and uh, that, that's that's I mean that, that that's awesome, and you're absolutely right, Lori. You're, I, and, I, and I'm very excited about it. But I think the one thing that I, that I struggle with when it comes to this stuff, and, I, and I'm and I'm very bullish on crypto and 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 own and own some, but. What I'm very bull. What I'm very. What I struggle with with crypto and, and Web three is explaining it to someone that's older. Right? Like my 67 year old dad. He's probably watching this right now. What's up, dad? <laughs> How do I get him to like be to, to buy into this stuff? Right? Because you're using words like tokenomics. You're using words like Web three. You're using words like use your own data. Be be in charge of your own security. <laughs> I mean, don't you think that's a little step too far for a lot of people? A lot of people use the same passwords one two three four. The same passwords across everything. I mean. Don't you think sometimes it's a little bit of a, a far-fetched thing to expect people to to know how to like be to secure all this stuff themselves? Like, there's a lot of like security stuff that I'm concerned with, especially with older users. But, so how do I convince someone like my dad to get into this stuff? Because I'm afraid if he's gonna get into this stuff, he's gonna lose all his money because some hacker is gonna get him. Uh, yeah, you you have the these concerns are valid, right? But we do see a transition in technology, and now. I hang out with a lot of baby boomers. I'm a Gen Xer, so I'm right in between millennials and baby boomers on the bridge to, and so when this happened back in the late 80s and early 90s, we had a very similar thing happening with new vocabulary. When we had to learn what a mouse, what windows were, what's a PC, this was, what's email? <laughs> what's a chat room you know those things right now today sound like they've been around forever but they haven't they've only been around for a couple of decades and baby boomers are just settling into all that new vocabulary still hmm. so when you talk about in informing them or educating them it's it's in a gentle way of this is the new technology this is the new vocabulary and it eventually just like uh, the generations before your grandparents or my grandparents back in the 50s were learning what's a credit card wow i could have put money on plastic on a piece of plastic that doesn't make any sense and it took a good couple of years to educate people how to use a credit card but to us it's a no-brainer you, you give everybody a card and most people use cards instead of cash now right mm. So it is a generational uh, thing, and it happens with every generation. I, when when you're your dad's age, right, uh, we're going to have the same another wave of technology, probably three or four more waves till then, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, you, so you're, you're right. Think, you're right. I yeah, think Lord. both systems will run in parallel. The decentralized system and the centralized system will run in parallel for the next five to ten years as we develop this new internet and it's a decentralized internet and that's the best way to explain it is that people get to keep their data rather than giving it away thank you laura that's a, that's an understandable explanation we focused a lot on like the older generation but i'm wanting to shift back to the younger generation and a lot of times you see younger generation investing in something whether it's speculated or not or they think they have growth opportunities but when you're talking about cryptocurrency since it's new we still have volatility a lot of times in the price but you know you still see younger investors or younger people still questioning still trying to understand this space um and they're still not fully not everyone's fully adopted but what do you think can bring more of the younger generation um into crypto and have mainstream adoption of crypto because a lot of them can understand the technology but what's holding those people back for mainstream adoption uh fear is one thing and that's with anything new right people have fear and it's who you listen to yeah. so your listeners uh, are, are forward thinkers, right? Yeah. So anybody who's a forward thinker is interested in the cryptocurrency and what it can do. Mm -hmm. And if you're educate and education is very important. I think all of us should actually practice sending five dollars through a digital wallet to somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Just so they can get the uh, used to the QR code uh, transfer of a payment. Uh, if we all do that, that'll help educate people and and make them feel more comfortable about a digital payment. Uh, but as far as what to choose as cryptocurrency and what's safe, uh, really, people need to learn what they're investing in. And 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 it's a big uh, thing right now. Everybody's being is able to create their own crypto. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what one question to ask is, what does that crypto? Why was it created? What is its use case? Mm -hmm. Does it have a purpose? Is the purpose just to make somebody a bunch of money so that they could pull out of the market? And there's a lot of cryptos like that, right? 
So you want to make sure you understand what does this crypto stand for? Is it going to have longevity? Is it contributing to the blockchain mm -hmm. and the blockchain developers and the new internet and, and the new ecosystem, the new digital economy? Oh. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, yeah. what is then the, if there's like a single piece of advice, I guess, older, young, you know, no matter who, who they are, um, or what age demographic they are, is there, you know, one thing that new investors should really be paying attention to when making market decisions around NFTs? Oh, so around <laughs> NFTs, <laughs> listen, if you want to create your own NFT and put your data on uh, the blockchain, uh, then you get to keep your data and it's perpetual income for you. Hmm. And so anybody who's going to uh, create an NFT uh, put their data on the N and on an NFT, you will make money on that for the rest of your life. Okay, so it's a new way to make money. Artists and musicians are are figuring that out. Uh, so my advice to somebody's investing in an NFT is, you know what? Do you think that this piece of data is going to have longevity? So if it is, and if you think somebody's going to buy it from you, you know, or if you're holding it for a collector's collector's item. You know, somebody was putting all the Beatles uh, pictures on uh, NFTs and they don't own them, but they're making NFTs out of them. So they do have some right to it. Isn't so that a it's bad a really, thing? Uh, well, I'd be yeah, kind of it's upset a really... if someone did that to me, if someone took all my like videos that I made and put them as NFTs or pictures that I took and was profiting off of them, I'd be kind of upset about that. Or is it expanded, well, sure. a expanded like exposure? It's expanded exposure for the NFT and uh, also every day when we upload uh, data into the cloud and into Facebook, you're giving your data away mm. free. Well, I am giving so it away, but I get, well but, but I get like a service out of it. I get to connect with my family members and whatnot. I get, to, I get entertained through videos and whatnot. You're right. It's not good. I don't want people having my data, but I get some sort of utility out of it. And the problem with yeah. the, the NFT part is that like if someone's taking my information, putting it on the blockchain, and like you said, the Beatles example, like I'm sure the Beatles people are probably upset about the fact that some dudes selling their pictures as an NFT and they're not profiting off of it, even though it's their work. Yeah, so this is going to be one of the topics is the intellectual property rights mm -hmm. and patent law. And so being on the blockchain, you can always see who the originator of that information is, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they own it. Uh, you, you do know who the originator is, so you know where, the, where it came from. If there's ever going to be a suit in the future, you can always go back to the person who uploaded it, right? So it's there. It doesn't go away. But tokenomics, it's the future. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, yeah, what, what if like one day kids are, kids are instead of like economic books in college, they're opening up tokenomic books in, in, <laughs> in college. Um, yeah, maybe I would have done a better job in, in, in econ if that was the case. But anyways, <laughs> thank you so much, Lori, for, for joining You're us. Welcome. All right, guys, let's get into now, next, and never. Yes, guys, I have now and I'm super excited. So for now, right now, what's happening? Waymo, Google's self-driving unit, has begun offering its San Francisco employees full sub autonomous rides, the company said Wednesday. And what's happening now is their rider-only operation is going to initially begin in San Francisco, but they're planning to expand that later. Obviously, they have to go through regulatory areas and the regulatory factions. But why I like this, guys, because I'm someone that would love autonomous vehicle driving. What you can do when you're in an autonomous vehicle is you can spend your time scrolling through Zade's TikTok, throwing scoops in Cole's <laughs> newsletter, and getting all your stuff that you need while not worrying about someone speaking to you or driving. It's the best. I think it's something that's going to happen, and it's happening right now, Nicole. Ooh, very almost Jetsons-like, but anyways. <laughs> uh, happening next is Lizzo. In her very first business venture outside of music, is partnering with Fabletics to build a size-inclusive shapewear brand called Yiddy, which is plenty funny, uh, but it is launching April 12th and Yiddy will be entering a shapewear market that's really been in recovery mode. Uh, it fell 24% that market in 2020, which makes a lot of sense. I don't think uh, shapewear and going out with that was maybe on people's top priority list in 2020. Um, but shapewear sales did bounce back 41% last year per NPD group. So I have a feeling that it's just going to keep getting higher in 2022 as the world opens up and and all the things. So kudos to Lizzo, maybe following a little bit in like Riri's footsteps, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's a great name. I have uh, <laughs> I have never, uh, never uh, expected or wanted hackers to obtain customer data from Apple 
Meta and Snap using forged illegal re uh, forged legal requests. So what these hackers were doing were uh, sending out emails to Apple and Meta and other and other platforms as like law enforcement saying, hey, we need phone numbers, IP addresses, addresses of some customers. And they were just given that information by these tech platforms. Um, so, it, you know, that's that's never good. And these hackers are getting more and more clever when it comes to obtaining information. Uh, they're so sophisticated. It's ridiculous. Always, always think back to the time I got Instagram hacked. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh man. All right. Be careful with your with your things, guys. Um, anyway, that does it for our show today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to comment, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. We'll see you tomorrow. Peace. Peace. Hey, thanks for watching everybody. Be sure to like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and be sure to tune in tomorrow.